Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, I'm ready to get into the Word of the Lord. Are you ready to get into the Word of the Lord? Yes. Hey, listen, we don't, we don't ever come into this place to hear from a man. We don't ever come to hear from a woman or the old or the young or anything like that. We got nothing to say. Men have nothing to say. All you have to do to realize that is to turn on the television and watch somebody's speech. You realize that men have nothing to say. We don't come to hear from men. We come to hear from God. And I'm fully expectant that God is going to be our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher today. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. I'm not going to get down on my knees. I learned a hard lesson yesterday that 10 years ago I could go swimming with the youngins and I can do flips into the pools and dives and all that stuff and it'd be just fine. But I learned that now I have to stretch. Otherwise, I have this thing in my back called a sciatic that doesn't want to move anymore. So I'm going to stand and pray. If you're able to stand, why don't you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer today? Father, we come before you, Lord, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, we don't take it for granted that we have the freedoms to come into this house to worship you, to, to seek after you, and most importantly, to hear your word for our lives to be equipped. But God, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we live in a country that allows us the, the religious freedom to seek after you without fear of persecution. So Father, we thank you that on this holiday weekend, 4th of July, our Independence Day weekend, Lord, we thank you for our nation and Lord, for our leaders. We ask that you would lead them, guide them, Father, uh, direct them and to, to, to take this nation, to take this country in the direction that you would have it to go. Lord, we thank you for as we come into this place, Lord, that we come to hear from you, Lord. We fully acknowledge that it's Jesus that's the senior leader of this church. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask your Holy Spirit would be our teacher today, Lord, to be our counselor. Lord, we thank you that your word says that we have the, the, the church and the, the preachers for the equipping of the saints. So, Lord, here we are today, Lord, to be equipped, to be prepared, to go and to leave the walls of this auditorium, Lord, and to be your church. And, Lord, we thank you for all the things that you've blessed us with and all the blessings that you've given to us. We don't ever think of ourselves as better than anybody else here at The Rock, but Lord, we are co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So Father, all across the Inland Empire, there are churches meeting and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for harvest and, and, and sandals in the grove and the well and the way. Lord, we thank you for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist. God, we, we ask that you set your hand on, on, on Ecclesia, Lord, on, on uh, Oak Valley, on Crossroads, on New Life. God, we thank you for all the churches across the world, Lord, we, uh, that, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we are brothers and sisters together working to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I'm excited for what God's got in store for tonight. I know that it's a, it's a good word. It's an encouraging word. Tonight, is, uh, I'll just give you the, the uh, heads up as we get into the word. Um, it's an opposite message. You know what that means? I'm going to teach you how to not do something. In hopes that logic stands that if you do that, that if you do the opposite, you actually will succeed. Okay? So you're like, Pastor Luke, you're, you, yeah, it's all right. You'll, it'll make sense. Okay? I just wanted to give you that right now so, that, so you understand where we're going tonight. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians in the third chapter. It's a really fun verse, really cool verse. I'm excited as I was studying this. It just came, out, it came alive to me. And I, I remember, um, she might be watching online right now. She, she doesn't live in the Inland Empire anymore. Many of you, many of you know... Um, uh, of this uh, faithful person that was uh, one time an employee of the church. We, we had this lady that worked at the church for a long time. Her name was Sarita. And Sarita, she just, she really exemplified this verse. She, it was, she was so amazing. As uh, Sarita came from a home that she just didn't have anything. She came from a family that she didn't have anything. She had a son. And, and, and you know, she just grew up in, in poverty. She grew up just thinking that this is all that life had. And as she got connected in church, she started working here at The Rock. And as she got connected, she just realized that God was one of those, serving God was just over and above. And I remember one time, Sarita, uh, she, she had bought a car. It was a, a Ford Mustang. It was a red Ford Mustang. I mean, she was so proud of that Mustang. It was her car. And I remember she said one time, we were all out there kind of like, hey, congratulations. It was her first new car that she had ever bought. And she said, you know, pastors, I got to just tell you, this is my Ephesians 320 car. And in Ephesians, the third chapter, verse number 20, we'll go ahead and put it up on the overhead. It says, now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or we think. 
And it was such a testimony to hear Sarita talk about this car because this was something that was over and above that she could ever ask or think. You see, where she came from, the life that she had lived, the experiences that she had gone through and endured in her life, she never thought that she would have a brand new car. She never thought that she would drive a, a, a red Mustang, you know, a sports car and that she would be flashy on the, on the freeway and, and smiling down the road. And, and the fact that God had blessed her in her life so much so that she had this car. She said, man, this is just something that was over and above what I ever thought or I could ever imagine that God had for me. Now, that's such a simple illustration, such a simple story of, of a car. But you know, the thing is, is that God is a God that is over and above. You see, God is a God that goes over and beyond and above and beyond our wildest expectations. And I love how Paul the Apostle, as he was talking to the church in Ephesians, he talks to, about them. And this is an exhortation. This is truly a, a, an exhortation to the church in a closing statement of his thoughts. And he says, God is able, able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. I love that. I, I've been so focused in lately on, on um, action words, and there's so many action words in this, uh, this verse. He sees God is able. He's able to do that. It means God's not restrained. He's not restricted. God is over and above. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. I love how he used uh, those action words together. I watched this cooking show where all these contestants gather together. They're all home cooks, and, 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 and there's a couple of celebrity chefs that grade or they, they rate their, their dishes, and there's one celebrity TV chef, and he always, he always uses the same type of, of illustration because he, he wants to exemplify it. He says, the most amazing, the most incredible, the most, the most and he uses these, that double positive, you know, not just the, the uh, I want an amazing dish. He says, I want the most amazing dish. I want the, the, most, the most ridiculous thing. And, and it's always this thing. And I love how Paul did the same thing. God's not just able to do exceedingly above. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly, meaning there is so much more to God than meets the eye in our lives. And what we ask, what we think, what we believe, God says, I'm able to meet that need. I'm able to meet that requirement. But let me tell you something. I'm ready to exceed and to go above your expectation, to go above and beyond what your faith says, because God says, I've got a plan for you. But the really neat thing is it says, according to the power that works in us. You see, that's God's power, God's mighty and divine power that works on the inside of us. But I love how he brought this back home to God is able, God is willing, God is here, he's exceeding, he's abundant, but it's according to the power that works in us, which, is, which brings it back home to you and I that we are the vessels which carry out the will and the action of God. We kind of talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that we are the vessels in which God's will is carried out. So God is able to do abundantly or above what we can ask or think according to his power, but it works in us. So there's a formula there which uh, you see or a partnership or a connection that is God and it's us together. God's power, our lives. Tonight, I, I want to start a, a two-week series and we're going to talk about this. The title of the two-week series is called Limitless. Limitless, a limitless life, you see, because God is limitless. There's nothing that God cannot do. There's nowhere that God cannot go. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the alpha. He is the omega, the, the first and the last. He knows all, sees all, is all. But I want to talk tonight, before we talk about a limitless life for you and I, I want to talk about the subject of limiting God. That's a heavy statement. How can we, Pastor Luke, as human beings, limit a limitless God? That, that seems to be, uh, 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 it doesn't work. They, 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 that's, uh, they argue each other. And the, the, the fact is, is that you and I, as Paul the Apostle says, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power which works in us. We are those vessels. So in our lives, there are things that we have got to do, things that we've got to pay attention to in our lives so that we don't limit the blessings. We don't limit the favor. We don't limit the power of God in our lives. Because you see, God's not going to bless us. God's not going to uh, pour out favor on us when we're in, wrong, in a wrong position or in the wrong place with him because that would be an encouragement to you and I to stay in that position, to stay in that power. 
power. God's not bound by you and I. Let's get that straight right off the bat. You and I, the, the title tonight is Limiting God's Blessing, so we're talking about how we limit God, but let's just be very clear. God is not bound. He is not limited by us. But he is bound by his word. He is bound by his promises. God is bound by him himself and, his, and what he stands to. And what God has promised us is based on our, on our lives. And so by the way we live, by the things in our hearts, by the thoughts in our minds, we might limit God's favor. We might limit God's blessing. We might limit God's power in our lives. And so today I want to look at that of what some things that, that you and I can do to limit God's power. Because I know each and every one of us in this place truly want to limit God in our lives. Because we, we don't want more than enough. We don't, want, we don't want that extra. We don't want that exceedingly abundantly. We just want good enough, right? Okay, wait. We, we just, we don't want exceedingly abundantly. We don't want over and above. We don't want God to exceed our expectations. We just want to live good enough, right? All right, praise God. You got that. All right, good. All right, good. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, we got, we got to start over on this one. So well, let's learn some things that we can do that limit God's power so that by way of understanding what we can do to limit God's power when we don't do these or when we do the opposite of these, when we live according to God's will, God's way, then by effect, by reason, and by logic stands to show us that this is what enables or encourages God's blessing, his favor in our lives. So let's talk first, and then next week we're going to talk about the, a, a limitless life going beyond your expectations. But this week, let's look at limiting a limitless God. Uh, in Psalms, the 78th chapter. The psalmist is talking and recounting the, the, the children of Israel in their wilderness experience. In Psalms, in the 78th chapter, it says that they, that they tempted him again and again. They tempted God and they what? Limited the Holy One of Israel. So here, we see in the word of God out of the mouth of the psalmist that the children of Israel, by way of tempting God, by way of doing things their way, by way of, of living life their way, by, by way of their stubbornness, by way of their temptation to God, by way of their pressing God, they limited the Holy One of Israel. So today, let's look at some things that we do that limit God in our life. I have some just single words. We're just going to talk about single words today of limiting God. A couple of things, simple things. Uh, the, the message tonight, not deep, not complicated. Simple, simple, simple. Because I believe when we get these, when we understand these, that's when our life really begins to take off. So talking about limiting God. Number one, actually there are no numbers. So it's not number one. Limiting God today. Some things that limit God. First that we'll discuss tonight is unbelief. Unbelief. How can we limit God? We limit God by not believing. Let me say it like this. Unbelief stands to say it can't happen. You can look at your situation. You can look at your finances. You can look at your children. You can look at your job. Like Sarita talking about that Ephesians 3.20 car. She can look at, this, at, at where she grew up, the way she was, the where she was in life and say, that kind of a car, that kind of a life, that kind of a dream, that just can't happen to me. And by way of unbelief, what we are doing is we are stifling the blessings of God. We are literally throwing a wet blanket over the power and the presence of God in our lives by saying, God, that cannot happen to me. So if we want to learn how to, un, or how to be unaffected in life, if we want to learn how to put limits on a limitless God, simply put, all we've got to do is stop believing or not believe that God is able to do what he says he's able to do. And unbelief will bring us to that place. You see, unbelief, simply put, comes from a lack of trust. If you don't trust Jesus, you won't put your life in his hands. Yesterday... We took a, our, our new group of interns uh, for the children's ministry, for the youth ministry, for, for our young adults ministry. We took them out and we have a, a day of training, a day of group and team building activities. And, and one of the last activities that we do for the day is, is called a trust fall. Does anybody know what a trust fall is? Does anybody not know what a trust fall is? A couple of you. Okay, a trust fall is very simple. A trust fall is you stand somewhere high. 
elevated off the ground. In the case of yesterday, it was on a four-foot ladder. You stand on the very top of that. You hold your hands to your chest, and you have a group of people that stand behind you on the ground four feet below you. And you say, I will trust you, and you fall, <laughs> expecting them to catch you. Yeah. Some of you are like, nope, nope. Well, don't sign up for the internship because it's a requirement. <laughs> no, I'm just up to see. But you see, it all starts with a belief. You see, every one of those, I even did it myself. I, I think I set the record for how fast somebody did it because I, I, I don't like heights. So I got up on top of that ladder and then and the part of the trust fall was, what are you going to leave behind this year? And I says, okay, I'll leave behind my fear of heights. You guys ready? Yeah, okay, here we go. And I went. And they were like, whoa. And I'm like, I'm not standing on this thing thinking about what I want to get rid of. I'm going to go right now. But you see, I would never have leaned back and, and put my, you, you might even say, put my life in those people's hands if I did not believe that their arms were out to catch me. But I see, I see Brad, I see, I see Ariel, I see Beth right over there. I see our interns. They're all here today. Why? Because each and every one of them did it because they believed there was a trust there that when they leaned back, that somebody was there to catch them. And that's exactly what unbelief stems from, is that if we don't trust God, if we don't trust that God is in control or that God has a plan for our situation, then unbelief boils up or unbelief comes from the deepest and the darkest places of our lives. And it shows the distrust that we have for God and it stifles or it puts a damper on God's ability to do anything in our lives. You say, how could that work? Well, if you've got your Bibles, go to me the book of Mark. Mark in the, first cha or Mark in the sixth chapter. Check this out. Mark in the sixth chapter, talking about limiting a limitless God. Mark in the sixth chapter. Jesus, uh, talking about limiting God. Let's, talk, let's see a real life story of the limitations of God. And Mark in the uh, people limiting God. And Mark in the sixth chapter, starting in verse number one. Jesus goes to his hometown. So verse number six, or chapter number six, verse number one says, and then he, speaking of Jesus, went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did he get this wisdom? Where, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom works uh, is in is in." Where, oh, oh my goodness, okay. And what wisdom is this? I, I'm just, all right. Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him? That such mighty works are performed by his hands. The people of Nazareth said, they saw it. They recognized it. Jesus had already come into town with a reputation that mighty works were performed by his hands. Where did they get this? They heard the stories of what Jesus did. Look at verse number, or the, 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 verse number three. Says, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters with us? So they were offended at him. Offended at Jesus. Verse number four goes on. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Many of Jesus' brothers did not believe until he died on the cross and rose from the grave. Now, verse number five, he could do no mighty work there. Did you notice how it says he could do no mighty work there? Why? Because their hearts were hardened. They saw, they had heard, they heard the reputation that this is a man who did great and mighty things with his hands by the power of God. But because they were offended at him, because they did not trust him, because they thought of him as Jesus the carpenter's son, Jesus was not uh, able to do what he was will, wanting and willing to do in there. It says, he said that he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. You and I, in our unbelief, by the lack of trust in God, can stifle God's presence, can stifle God's ability in our lives to work on our 
behalf. So what we have to do is, is to work, to, to, to trust God, to not listen to the thoughts of our minds, to not listen to the critics, to not listen to the, to the negative reviews or to the go to the worst case scenario, but rather to go to what the word of God says and says, this is the foundation of what I will believe. I won't stand on that this is, that, that people, what people say that the Bible was written by men, or I won't believe what they say, or I'm not going to listen to the critics. I'm going to listen to God. And by way of listening to God and feeding my heart, the word of God, I will not allow myself to be fed unbelief from my mind so that we don't stifle the presence of God. Talking about limiting God, another thing that limits God in our lives is doubt. See, unbelief says it can't happen. Doubt says it won't happen. We, have, we, we, we are this way. I talked about this last Sunday morning and Saturday morning. We're talking about spiritual warfare. By our human nature, you see, man and, and our human nature, we, we go automatically to worst case scenario. My dogs, uh, last week on Friday night, uh, the, somebody left my gate open and my dogs got out of the yard. They ran away. I'm teaching on spiritual warfare and I'm talking about not letting the thoughts of my mind control being guarded by the helmet of salvation and automatically at, at 1 o'clock in the morning as I see coyotes running down the street, I've already gone to the worst case scenario. My dogs were eaten. And I have to tell myself, no, I'm not going there. No, I'm not going there. I wake up in the morning and there was a shy of hope. Okay, Saturday morning, nobody's called. They, my dogs had tags on their, on, their, on, their, on their necks. Somebody had to call. Well, nobody called. Surely that means that because they're at the animal shelter, somebody turned them in and the animal shelter was closed. So we called the animal shelter. No, we don't have your dogs. Ah, oh, well, I guess they're lost. So we start Googling puppies. Dogs haven't even been lost for 24 hours and we're already making plan B. And we have to tell ourselves, my wife and I, no, we're not going there. We're not listening to that because doubt says it won't happen. But I pray and I said, God, you bring my dogs home. They're my testimony. They're my family. You bring them home. And if you cared about the one lost sheep in the parable, if you cared about Saul's father's donkeys, you care about my, my dogs. Sunday rolls around. No calls. Okay, start thinking about it again. My, my mother-in-law makes a deal with a breeder across the, the country that she has a boy, he has a girl, they'll trade, we get a puppy. No! Have to tell ourselves, we cannot do that because doubt says it probably won't happen. But I asked God and I asked you, the church, to pray for me and my family that they would return. And I can't allow myself to say it won't happen and go to plan B when I've asked God for something because that is called doubt. And doubt says it probably won't happen. And if I want to limit God, all I got to do is doubt him and I will limit God's ability in my life. Monday morning rolls around. We wake up, all right, this is the first time we don't have church. This is the first time we don't have a day of services. This is the first time all of the family's not coming over to help us put flyers all over the city. So my wife and I look at each other and we say, okay, we know this is the day that's going to be a tough day for us because we're just sitting around. All we've got to do is think about what could, what, what could have, what should have, what, what we should have done. And we looked at each other and we said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to allow that to come into our lives. We're not going to allow doubt. We're not going to allow unsettling or, or, or discomfort to be in our lives. We're going to pray. We're going to believe that God has them in his hands. And so we prayed at 8 o'clock in the morning. At 8.30, the Holy Spirit spoke to my wife and said, you need to go to your neighbor's house. They're on vacation. They're not home. You need to go to your neighbor's house. And she walked over to my neighbor's house, opened the gate, and there are my dogs. They weren't there the whole weekend. We walked the streets every day calling their names. We, we knocked on the doors. Our neighbors went door to door. Not a bark, not a paw, not a scratch, not a movement. We looked under the fences for shadows. Somebody put them there because prayers work. And when I asked the congregation and I asked the church to pray for me and I prayed to God and I told my wife, I just have to have a peace about this because they're in God's hands. I have to say, I will not allow doubt. I will not allow plan B to come into my life. 
One of my favorite verses in the Bible, James in the first chapter. James in the first chapter, we'll just put it up on the overhead, says that if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Look what he says. But he says, but let him ask in faith. What? With no doubting. Why? For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Look what verse number 7 says. Let not that man suppose that he would receive anything from the Lord. So we want to live a, a life of just that's good enough, a live a life that where God's not our exceedingly abundantly, but God just might do this or he might do a little bit here. Simply put, all we got to do is doubt God and give a plan B for our lives. But if we want to live a life of limitless possibilities with God's blessing in our life, I'll tell you what, we have got to stop allowing ourselves to go to worst case scenario. Stop allowing ourselves to look at plan B. If God doesn't show up, what do we do? I love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said when they were... Uh, threatened with the furnace uh, with King Nebuchadnezzar. They said, King, we will not bow down to your idol. And if our God doesn't deliver us from the fire, we still will not bow from your, or for your idol. There is no plan B. If we die here or we live, there is no plan B because our God is just and our God is in control. That is how we live a life. <laughs> Limitless possibilities. Talking about limiting God. Talking about limiting God, some of the things that we can do to limit God, uh, another thing that we can do to limit God is silence, to say nothing. There are times in life when, the, when we are encouraged, we are exhorted, we are challenged by Christ to not say anything. But that, does not, that is not a blanket statement for us as Christians to go about life in silence and to not speak and to not do anything about the world around us. I love that there's a statement out there that says, all that is needed for evil to succeed in this world is for good men to do nothing. Silence is one of the most deafening sounds of Christianity in our society. Too many Christians sit idly by and do nothing or say nothing to improve their lives. Ecclesiastes in the third chapter, verse number 7, I have it in the New Living Translation, says, There is a time to tear and a time to mend. There is a time to be quiet and a time to speak. So Jesus says when you're being persecuted to turn the other cheek, all right, keep your mouth shut. But there are times when you and I have got to learn to speak about what we believe, to take a stand for what we stand for, to love the things that God loves and to hate the things that God hates and to not allow them in our lives or to compromise us in our lives. Are you with me today? I'm going to read you a statement. I'm going to read you an amazing man of God, D.L. Moody. Uh, a man, he was in Chicago, uh, responsible for a great outpouring, a great revival there with the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody writes this, I don't believe we will ever have the right atmosphere in this country until we can get men who have a backbone enough to stand up against the thing they believe is wrong. If it is a custom rooted and grounded for 100 years, never mind. Take your stand against it if you believe it is wrong. If you have gatherings... And it is fashionable to have wine and champagne. And you are a teetoler or a, uh, you're somebody who doesn't drink. And they ask you anyway, and you know that they will, have, they will ask you to have a drink. Tell them you're not going. And I love how this, he gives a personal illustration. They were going to have a great celebration in an opening of a saloon and billiard hall in Chicago. In the northern part of the city where I lived. I, it was to be a gateway to death and to hell, one of the worst places in Chicago. As a joke, they sent me an invitation to go to the opening. So I took the invitation and I went down and I saw the two men who had the saloon. And I said to them, is this a genuine invitation? They said, it was. Thank you, I replied. Uh, D.O. Moody says, I will be around, but if there's anything here that I don't like, I may have something to say about it. They said to me, you're not going to preach. He said, I may. They said, we don't want you to. We won't let you in. He said, how are you going to keep me out? I asked, here's the invitation. They said, we'll put a policeman at the door. What is the policeman going to do with that invitation, I asked. We won't let you in, they said. Well, D.L. Moody says, I will be there. He says, I gave him a good scare. 
And then I said to them, I'll tell you what, I'll compromise the matter. If you two men will get down here with me right now and let me pray for you, I'll let you off the hook. I got those two rum sellers down on their knees, one on one side of me, one on the other side of me, and I prayed that God would save their souls and smite their business. <laughs> one of them had a Christian mother, and he seemed to have some conscience left. After I had prayed, I said, how can you do this business? How can you throw this place open to ruin the young men of Chicago? Within three months, the whole thing had been smashed up and one of them was converted sometime after. I have never been invited to a saloon since. I love how he said that because he says, I'm going to speak out against the things I, I believe are wrong. But he didn't say, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick it and I'm going to condemn people. And I'm going to give a bad example for Jesus Christ. Because what I'm saying tonight is that you and I shouldn't remain silent. But we have got to be wise as representatives of Jesus Christ. That you don't go and condemn the world. That you don't go and be a bad representation of Jesus Christ. Because you're speaking out for what is right. But like James said, if anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask in faith. D.L. Moody went to those men and he says, I'm going to preach. And they said, you're not allowed. He says, okay, then let me pray. And he planted a seed, and one of those rum sellers, as he calls them, was converted sometime later. Why? Because he had a backbone to stand for what he believed in and to say what he knew God wanted him to say at that time. Church, we can no longer be silent about the things that God says it's time for us to speak out about. As Christians, we have got to have a voice, not only in our families, not only in our cities, in our jobs, but in our country, in the world. A voice that says God loves this world so much that he gave Jesus, a voice that says he's not here for condemnation, but it's time for us to open our eyes and to see who God is and how much he loves us and what life could be like with Jesus Christ. We've got to learn to speak up. Are you with me this morning? Talking about things that limit God. Uh, another thing that limits God, laziness. Oh man, laziness brought about by that darned thing we call television. Do you remember the parable of the talents? We were there a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday morning. The, the master gave the talents to, to each of his servants according to their ability. And two of them went and they traded and they bought and sold and they made a profit. But one of them, he came back and he says, I knew you're a hard taskmaster. I knew you, you reaped where you didn't gather or you sow, you gather where you, didn't, where you didn't plant. And he says, I was afraid, so I buried it. You remember the response of that, of that master? He says, you wicked and you lazy servant. If you knew this about me, you should have at least put it in the bank. Then I would have had interest. You see, a lazy servant says, I'm not going to do anything with what God has given me right now. Each and every one of us have something in our lives that God has given to us, that God has built us for a purpose. We are not here, church, to wander aimlessly through life. We are not here just to exist and to get by so that we can get to heaven someday. But we are here to be effective. We are here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are here to turn this world to Jesus Christ, to the glory of God in our lives. But that, that involves you and I doing something with our lives and not just being lazy with what God has given us. I know, that one's a tough one. Proverbs 13 chapter, verse number 4 says, The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. How many times in our lives? I'll, I'll be the first to admit to you. Man, there are times I look at somebody, or I, I look at where they're at, and I say, man, I want that. But I don't want to do what they did to get there. I just want it. I want to buy a ticket with some numbers, and I want somebody to call me on the phone and say, I got $10 million or $100 million right now for you just because. That's what I want. Does anybody else say, that's how I like that too. That's a good dream. The soul of the lazy man desires. Hey, I may desire that all my life, but it's not going to come to pass because the, the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. God put man on this earth and gave him a job to do something. God saw Adam. He said, Adam, here you are. There's your job. Get to it. Before Adam, I love this. Before Adam, young guys, young girls, before Adam had a wife, 
He had a job. Why? Because God said man has got to do something with his life. God's desire for us is to not sit on the couch, to not sit back and be lazy, to not let that, oh, well, that's somebody else's job. Oh, well, that's somebody else's responsibility. Oh, that's somebody else's harvest. God says you are the harvest. You are the workers. You are the field workers. You are the ones. We are the ones that do something for the kingdom of God right here, right now. Are you with me today? John 20, 20th, 20th chapter, verse number 21. Jesus says to his disciples, to you and I, as he sends them out a commissioning statement, he says, I send you as the Father has sent me, I send you. Jesus didn't come to the, to the earth when the fullness of time had come just to experience life. All right, now God can say, well, I did it. I lived as man. He had a vision. He had a goal. He had a plan, a purpose, each and every one of us. It doesn't matter how we come about. You could be the product of two drunken people one night, and you never even saw either one of them again. But here you are. You are on this earth for a purpose. It doesn't matter how you came. It doesn't matter how you started. What's important is how you finish. And God says, it's, let's not be lazy with our lives. Things that we can do to limit God, laziness, to sit back and let that be somebody else's job when it's really ours to do. We're talking about limiting God. Limiting God. What can we do in our lives to limit God? Pastor Deborah talked about that this this morning. Pastor Dan talked about it on Wednesday night. It was on my heart. I just said, well, we gotta just gotta gotta hammer it in there. Pride. What can you and I do to limit the blessings and the power of God in our lives? Pride. Pride says, my way is the best way. Pride says, like the opposite of what Jesus prayed, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Pride says, not your will, but mine be done. Pride, we look at ourselves, we look at our own efficiencies, we look at our own strengths, our own abilities to get the job done when we realize that we can't handle it, when we know for a fact that we cannot do this on our own. That's why Paul the Apostle says, I'd rather boast in my infirmities. I'd rather boast in my weaknesses because now I'm relying on God because it's not about how good, how great I am. It's not about how good looking you are. It's not about how smart you are. It's about how good God is. And we've got to learn that pride is one of the greatest ways that we can stifle God's power and his ability to work in our lives. We saw this in the Bible. If you've got your Bible, go with me to the book of 1 Peter. Go with me to 1 Peter. Pastor Deborah uh, quoted this uh, scripture this morning out of the book of James. But let's go to the book of 1 Peter today. 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. 1 Peter, chapter 5. You guys still with me today? Yeah. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. Verse number five, he says, likewise, you younger people. I think that's really important that Paul the Apostle talks about that. Some of you in this place, you're really young. I know. I, I'm a young person as well. I remember when I was 18 years old and I was leaving the house. I was moving to another state. I thought, like every other 18-year-old uh, out there, that I have it going for me. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody have teenagers in the house? They know it all. Right? You try to give them instruction, you try to tell them how to do something. I know. And you're just like, dude, oh man, you don't know. I can't wait. I can't wait till you get to the point where you realize how much you don't know. That's one of the things we love about our young adults ministry. We call uh, the young adults shift, we call it the junior high of life, of adult life. Because you're 20 years old, you're 18 years old, you realize, you think you got it all. You think you know it all, I know it all. Man, who are you to tell me about the Bible? By the time you get to 30 and you're out of the young adults, you realize, I don't know nothing. I am nothing. Uh, I, need, I need God in my life. So we do, we successfully break down our own, our own walls in that. But here he says, you young people, submit yourselves to your elders. We've got to realize that we don't know everything. That we don't know everything. That we, it's not about us. Yes, all of you. See, he doesn't just talk to the young people. You're like, oh, I got off good on that one. Praise God. He says, young people, submit to your elders. All of you be submissive to one another. What does that mean? Young to the old, old to the young. Together as a body of Christ, being submissive to listening to, to each other, to not relying on our own ability, our own thoughts, our own intellect, but relying on God in our lives. Be clothed with humility. Drape about it. Cover yourself in humility. Why? Because God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So we're talking about limiting God. If you want to have resistance from God, all you have to do is be 
proud. I don't know about you, but I've got enough resistance in my own life. I've got enough resistance in the world. I've got enough resistance just living and existing here today. I do not need any more from the hand of God who is limitless in his power, in his ability. I think, I think for me, I will choose to be humble in my life. Does anybody else say, man, I want to be humble in my life and I do not want to be proud? See, I love how Pastor Deborah put it this way. She said, pride or humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. I love one of our interns as, as we were doing the trust fall. They had to say, what is it that you're going to let go of? This year in your internship, what is one of the things you are going to remove or walk away from or turn away from in your life? And he says, man, I'm a selfish person. I'm, good. I'm glad you admitted it. I mean, that's the first step is realizing you've got a problem, right? So he says, I'm a selfish person, and this year I want to give myself to others more. And then he fell back, leaning into the hands of the people. You see, that we have got to learn that it's not about thinking how low we are, but rather just not thinking of ourselves, but thinking about others. To think about God as the leader of our life, submitting to God. And he will lift us up, it goes on to say, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You guys with me today? Can we, can we talk about one more thing that limits God? You're like, Pastor Luke, I cannot handle any more limiting God. One more, all right, I promise. One more. One more thing that you and I can do to limit God in our lives. Disobedience. Man, we could just flat out be disobedient to God. Disobedience says, I heard what you said. I'm going to do it this way anyways. As a parent, is there anybody who has children in the house? Any of you guys have or have had children? Isn't there, I mean, as a parent, Aren't, isn't that your most proud moment when you have instructed your child to do or to not do something and then they do the complete opposite anyways and you just look at them and say, man, I just, I, like, like Pastor Dan says, I'm not proud. I am so pleased with you that you don't want to listen to me. Does anybody ever say that in their life? I mean, no, right? Nobody says that because nobody wants their children. Nobody wants somebody that they've given an instruction or direction to. If you're on the job or if you're an employer and you give somebody a, a direction and they do it their own way even though you've given, nobody wants that. Yet in life, we hear the, the, the instructions from God. Oftentimes, I love one of our young adult leaders, he, he was teaching a message and he said the directions from God are always clear, but they may not always make sense. Meaning God has always gives us exactly what we need to do. It just may not make sense in our lives. And so because it doesn't make sense, we say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go do this over here because this makes more sense to me when really we should be following God. Looking at Jonah and the story of Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah? Anybody ever seen the VeggieTales movie? <laughs> remember the cucumber? All right, Jonah. God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them that they need to change their ways or I'm going to destroy them. And Jonah says, No. You know, remember how it said God resists the proud? There was probably a little bit of pride there in Jonah's life as he said, God, I'm going to go the opposite way you instructed me to go. I'm going to go the exact 180 degree opposite way because I'm going to do things my way. I want an itinerant ministry and I don't want it to be in San Bernardino. I want my itinerant ministry to be in Malibu, right? So Jonah says, I'm going to get on a boat and I'm going to go to the nice end of town versus the, 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 the other end of town. But God says, that's not the plan. And you know the story. The storm comes up and, and they start throwing things off the boat trying to lighten the load. And finally, Jonah breaks down. He says, okay, guys, it's my fault. Here I am. I, I did this. And they say, all right, here's the deal. You're out. They throw him over the boat. You know the story, a whale swallows or a great fish swallows Jonah for three days. Talk about humble pie. Anybody ever heard of eating a little bit of humble pie? How about living in a fish belly for three days? How we can limit God in our lives to be disobedient. Consequences. There's always consequences to disobedience. When one of my kids, when, when my three-year-old son, who's, who's a master at disobeying, I said, you know that, that, that terrible twos and terrible threes? I'm living it right now. And then I got another one coming right into it. It's like, oh, Lord, this shall pass, I know. But he is a master at disobeying. I mean, you tell him one thing, he does the complete opposite, just to test. Sometimes I think, though, we are like that with God. God gives us a direction, and we want to get as close to we, as we can to the edge without falling off to see how close we can get to God before, we, before, we, before we're there. When God says, I don't want you anywhere near the edge because you don't know if that edge is going to come falling off. You don't know if, that, if that, that ledge that you're standing on right now 
is, is going to come out from underneath you. God's desire for us is to not be disobedient, but to hear him and to obey him because it goes all the way back to like we talked about with belief, to trust in God. His directions, his plans, his, his, his plans for you and I may not always make sense to us, but they're always clear in our lives. God says, this is what I want you to do. God, I will trust you enough to listen and obey. I love what it says in Judges, uh, in Judges, the second chapter. Joshua has, has gone, and now a new generation of, of, of the Hebrews, of the, of the chosen ones, are, are here in the conquest of, of the promised land. And now they're going out there. And the Bible goes through Joshua, the first chapter, and God tells them, I want you to go, and I want you to subdue the land. I want you to drive these people out of their land. They had their chance. They missed their opportunity. And God says, now what was theirs is now yours. And I want you to get every person, man, woman, and child, out of their land because it is yours. Do not leave anybody standing. Do not allow anybody to remain where you are occupying because this is yours. Do not compromise. And the Bible goes through and judges in the first chapter and it talks about all the different tribes of, of Israel. How they, they didn't drive them out. And they conquested, but they didn't drive them out. And they came and they didn't drive them out of this land. And they came and they didn't drive them out of this land. And they came and they didn't drive them out of this land. And they compromised and they made treaties and they made agreements. And so in Judges, the second chapter, God comes back and he gives them the consequences for their actions. In Judges, the second chapter, verse number 1, it says, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bachim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Verse number two goes on and he says, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land and you shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? And he goes on, he says, therefore... I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. God said to his people, I told you, I gave you directions. You saw my faithfulness. I promised I wouldn't remove you from this, but I did not say that I would be your all, or I would do everything for you. It was your job to remove them, and you did it. And because you did it, the consequences of your life now is you will have to deal with that for the rest of your lives. One of the greatest ways you and I can stifle God's presence and God's power and God's ability in our lives, our limitless God, as it said in Psalm 70, Psalms 78th chapter, how we can limit a limitless God in our lives is to, is to first to, unbel to have unbelief in our heart, to the fact that we say, God, I just can't trust you, to have doubt in our minds, to go to that place of, of plan B, to, to, not un to not understand, to, to be quiet about things that we need to be vocal about, to share when it needs to be shared, to, to speak out against what needs to be spoken out against, to have a stance in our lives, uh, to things to limit God in our lives, to be lazy, to allow somebody to do our job for us rather than us doing it, to be prideful, to expect that we on our own can do things, and to be disobedient with God. But in turn, if we believe, if we say, God, you are God, you can, this will happen. If we turn, come and we ask God with a, a stance of faith saying that this is not a, it might or it could or I'll look at the other options, but God, I asked you, I, I said it, I won't allow myself. When we come with faith, if we come before God and we say, God, I will speak for what you want me to speak about. I will open my mouth when you want me to open my mouth. God, I will work when you want me to work. God, I will cover myself with humility so that I don't rely on my own ability. When we say, God, I will obey obey your voice and I will do what you have asked me to do. Whether it makes sense to me or whether it doesn't is not relevant. God, I will do that. Then God says to you and I, I am a God who is exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to the power of God that works in us. And we don't stifle the presence and the power and the blessings of God in our lives. Truly, we can live life to the greatest of expectations in God beyond what we could ask or think, which means, guys, when Jesus says, I have come to give you life and I have come to give it more abundantly, Jesus meant that over and above, exceedingly and abundantly above what we could ask or think. So I ask you today, what does abundant life mean to you? And then multiply that exponentially because that is what it means to God. 
but we have got to do our part to not stifle, to not put out, to not limit the powers of a powers, powerless God in our life so that he can be exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing before we conclude. It'd be a shame for us to have service and to, not, and to have worship and have opportunity to spend time with God, but not to give you the opportunity to examine your heart and your life and to see where you stand with God. Because it would be a travesty today if you walked out of this place and your heart stopped beating and you died and you ended up going to hell because you weren't in a right place with God. So I want to ask you that question. If you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Answer that within your heart. Answer that within your head. Nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. It's not about you and the person next to you. It's about you and God right now. Answer that honestly within your heart. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you've got a positive outlook on life? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you hope or because you want to that you're going to get into heaven because you think you're going to go? Do you know nowhere does it say that because your parents told you you're a Christian, that because you go to church, because you volunteered in the youth or the children's ministry, because you've got a cross or St. Christopher or around your neck, or you've even got a tattoo of a scripture or a Jesus reference somewhere on your body, that you're going to get into heaven? You're not going to find that anywhere in the Word of God that because you think, because you hope, because you want to, because somebody told you, because you're sitting in a certain location listening to somebody speak that you're going to get into heaven. You see, the reality is, is that it's God's heaven. The only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way. We, we live in a society that tells us, a world that tells us that you get there your way, I'll get there my way, we'll all get there the same. But the, the, the truth is, is that the only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way. It's not about how good we are in life. The Bible tells us that good deeds, our good deeds according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. So nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. You know why? Because God's standard for heaven is perfection. And the only one that was perfect was Jesus. And Jesus Christ says this. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. So it's not about how good we are in life. It's not about whether or not we sit in church. It's not about whether or not we memorize John 3.16 or a couple other Bible verses. Hey, listen, it's not even about whether or not we know who Jesus is or not. The Bible tells us the devil in hell and the devil in hells. The devil and demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. It's not about anything that we could do on our own, but ultimately it's, all, it's about giving God something in our lives. Jesus is speaking to a man by the name of Nicodemus in the book of John in the third chapter. A subject, a discussion of eternal life, and as Jesus and Nicodemus are having this conversation, you would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, man, you just keep on doing what you're doing. Because Nicodemus memorized the word of God. Nicodemus wore the right clothes. He said all the right things. He, he, he gave to the poor. He prayed for people. He, 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 he was a good person. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, instead of patting him on the back, Jesus says to Nicodemus these words. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now you've heard that term. Our society, culture, has made that out to be radical, weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. Born again in the eyes of God. Born again has always meant the same thing. It's not about what Hollywood or what, what sitcoms have made it out to be. They have no concept of God. But simply put, born again means this to God. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with him. Let me prove it to you. The last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. People like you and I. And he's speaking to the church and he says that he's coming back. And when he comes back, he better find us hot or he better find us cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, Jesus says he will vomit us from his mouth. Whoa. Shocking statement. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? Well, let's define that. Let's talk about that. Lukewarm is simply like a warm soda or a warm drink on a hot day. It doesn't do the job. Lukewarm, in, in, in terms of your relationship with Jesus, means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. Hey, you're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. God says that that's you. You're riding the fence. You're in an uncomfortable position, and you're not. You're deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. Here I am today. Listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough to tell you the truth, to honor you and tell you exactly what the Word of God says. You can't get to heaven based on your own devices. You can't get to heaven based on your own wants, your own will, your own think, your own thoughts. You can't get to heaven based on your carnal knowledge of who God is. You've got to get to heaven God's way, and, and that is through Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity in just a moment. Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, Jesus said, I'll deny you. So how do we do this? How do we confess him? How do, how do we confess him before men? I want to give you the opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible real loud, just like that. Bang! 
And when I smack my hand on my Bible, I want, to, I, want to, I want to challenge you to do something. Here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, today I want to give God all my life. Pastor Luke, today I want to, I want to, I want to give him my heart. Pastor Luke, today I want, to, I want to be saved. I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You say, man, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. I don't know if I can do that. The people that I came with, they're going to see me. You know what? You might be embarrassed. Yes, but let me encourage you. Don't let a moment of embarrassment, an irrational emotion, stop you from making the very best decision you could ever make as a human being. This is the best decision. God's desire is for you to make this, but it's your choice and yours alone. You can't make the person next to you. God's not a manipulator, a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And listen, you've got to understand, God's not a kid on an, on a, on a, on a, oh, sitting over an anthill with a magnifying glass waiting to burn you up. Or he's not in heaven holding a two-by-four waiting to smack you over the head for what you've done. God loved you enough to give Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die a beaten, bloody a mess on a cross for you and I so that we could receive the gift of God, eternal salvation. It's our choice. God's not in the business of condemning men to heaven or, or condemning men to hell, but rather he's in the business of redeeming men to heaven. It's our choice today. I want to encourage you to make that choice. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you've never given him your heart. Maybe you've never given him your life. In just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise your hands? Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did this as a child or at a Harvest Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through with it. Today, if that's you, listen, don't walk out of this place without making sure. Who should raise your hands? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. Hey, talking about tonight's message, you've been living a life limiting God in your, in your life. Listen, let's make this the night you go forward in your relationship with God, leaving the past behind, and you get hot for God, and you see what God does in your life. Because Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. The decision is yours. Free will choice. It's not going to force his way or make his way in. It's your choice. So whether you're in the front row or the back row, listen, wherever you're at in this place, if that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, I want you to be bold. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. The decision is yours. So whether you're in the front row, family rooms, you guys back there in the family rooms, if that's you, listen, I'm talking to you. I'll see your hands back there. If you're listening to the sound of my voice, maybe you're at home watching my television. If that's you, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't wait another minute. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, get ready. Pop your hand up. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three. I see you guys right over there. Four. I see you. Five, six, seven. I see you right over there. Seven wise people. Eight right over there. I see you right over there. Nine. I see you right over there in the back. Anybody else in this place? If, you, if there's nine, you know there's ten. Where are you at, number ten? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on. If that's you in this place, ten, I see you back there. Ten wise people. Anybody else? I see ushers pointing. Eleven. I see you there, my man. Eleven wise people. Anybody else in this place say, man, I wonder if I should. This is your moment. This is your time. I see you guys pointing in this direction. Anybody else? Anybody wave? All right, I see that hand over there. Twelve wise people. Anybody else in this place today? I'm going to close it up. I'm going to finish it up right now. Twelve wise people. Well, hey, praise God for twelve wise people. All right, here's what we're going to do really quickly because we have run out of time. For those of you that raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, here's what we do. You say, I want to get saved by raising your hand. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. So we're going to pray a prayer with, with you. We're going to help you. We're going to give you some information. So here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand. Nobody leave because when you leave, that discourages them from coming forward. But if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand in the front row, back row, wherever you're at, if that's you, if you raise your hand, come on. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. If you came with somebody, a friend, bring your friend with you. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and meet me right up here at the altar. We're going to change destinies today, right here, right now. So that's you. Come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Let's change destinies together right now. Yeah, that's you. Come on.
Well, hey, listen, first things first. Okay, you got to wipe that frown upside down, all right? You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy waving, over, waving at you over here? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Oh, my goodness, I am as weird as it gets at this church, I promise, and you made it through me, okay? He's going to take you right over there. What he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer, okay? You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. So he's going to lead you in a prayer to do that. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information. So you walk out of this place and say, man, what do I do next? We're going to point you in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to give away a friend. We give away friends here at the church. Somebody that will sit with you before church to buy a cup of coffee, sit with you for five weeks, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, all right? So if you would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.